Hello Hazelden Builders, my name is Travis Weber and I'm a safety manager here at Hazelden Construction. I'd like to take some time today to review the hazards and the protective measures associated with exposures to respirable crystalline silica. Many of our activities on a day-to-day -day basis generate respirable crystalline silica and may expose employees to this harmful dust. The purpose of this training today is to heighten your awareness and to better protect yourself and your coworkers. Our goal at Hazelden is to always provide a safe and healthy work environment free from recognized hazards. Crystalline silica is a basic component of soil, sand, granite, and many other minerals. Quartz is the most common form of crystalline silica. This can be found of many of the earth's raw materials and man-made materials such as concrete, concrete mixes, masonry blocks, bricks, and many materials used on construction projects. Silica exposure can occur during many different construction activities. Exposure to this harmful dust can occur when respirable sized dust particles become airborne and are inhaled during concrete mixing, dry cutting, hammer drilling, chipping, abrasive grinding, tuck pointing, and even dry sweeping of concrete floors. As the worker breathes, Silica crystals flow into his mouth and nose and down the air passages deep into the lungs. The tiny crystals enter the small fragile air sacs where oxygen is absorbed into the blood. Immune system cells called macrophages engulf and try to dissolve the crystals but they are unable to. Over time, more and more crystals build up inside the macrophage cells. The macrophages carry the silica into the walls of the lung, where they die. Scar tissue forms around the dead cells and spreads as more cells die. This damage can continue even after the exposure to silica stops. Eventually, so much scar tissue forms that the lungs can no longer function. There are three types of silicosis. The first type is known as chronic silicosis, which is the most common form. This typically occurs after 15 to 20 years of moderate to low exposure to respirable crystalline silica. The symptoms associated with chronic silicosis may or may not be obvious. Therefore, workers would need a chest x-ray to determine if there is lung damage. Accelerated silicosis can occur after five to 10 years of high exposure to respirable crystalline silica, and these symptoms include severe shortness of breath, chest pain, and respiratory failure. Acute silicosis occurs only after a few months or as long as a few years following exposures to extremely high concentrations of respirable silica. And these symptoms include severe disabling shortness of breath, weakness, and weight loss, which will often lead to death. 1935, a wave of fear was sweeping the country. Silicosis was taking its toll from the ranks of American workers. Cause of the disease, dust. Results of the disease, disablement, poverty, death. Cure for the disease, none. Throughout America, workers exposed to dust grew fearful of their health, of their very lives. 1936, amid these alarming events, the Secretary of Labor called together a national conference to study this disease. A committee of 60 experts was appointed and a year later reported to the Secretary of Labor. The U.S. Department of Labor first highlighted the hazards of respirable crystalline silica in the 1930s after a wave of worker deaths. The department set standards to limit worker exposures in 1971 when OSHA was created. However, more recent studies have shown that the standards were not adequate to protect employees. In 2013, a final rule was proposed by OSHA that made substantial changes to reduce the exposure levels of respirable crystalline silica to workers while improving worker protection. The final rule was issued to curb lung cancer, silicosis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and kidney disease in American workers. This new rule was developed to save lives and prevent future cases of silicosis.
final rule for silica was established in the 29 CFR construction standards under the new subsection 1926-1153. This new standard went into effect as of June 2016. Because of the health hazards associated with silica, OSHA has reduced the permissible exposure limit or PEL to silica dust to 50 micrograms per cubic meter on an 8 hour TWA or time weighted average. The new standard is basically one-fifth of what was previously allowed for construction. In this picture, we can see the size of a piece of beach sand in comparison to the human hair. The beach sand is about 90 micrometers in diameter and the human hair on average is 70 micrometers. The particles of silica dust that become respirable and trapped in the lungs are those illustrated here that are 10 micrometers in diameter and smaller. The smaller the particles become, the deeper in the lungs that they can be trapped. These little respirable dust particles are about one-seventh the diameter of the human hair. In reality, these are little floating particles in the air that you cannot see and probably do not even know are being inhaled. The new OSHA rule that have provided two options to maintain compliance with the standard to offer the protection needed. Option one is simply follow the dust control methods found in table one of the construction standard. When these methods to control the dust are followed correctly, employers are not required to measure worker exposures. The second option is to control the dust with our own protective measures, then measure the amount of silica dust to which workers are exposed. If it is at or above the action level, then we must find better measures to protect workers from crystalline silica dust and continue with further air monitoring. The new standard also requires the employer to establish and implement a written exposure control plan. Hazelden Construction has developed a written exposure control plan that illustrates the required engineering controls, work practices, and appropriate PPE required when working around respirable crystalline silica dust. Let's go ahead and review some of the typical silica dust creating work activities that you may be exposed to and then look at each of the protective measures that are required by the written exposure control plan. Let's take a moment and look at the requirements for floor sweeping activities. The personal protective equipment for this scope of work will require the standard issued Hazelden PPE. There are no other special PPE requirements for this task. We have identified that the tool being used for this will be a broom and the dust control methods that are required include the use of sweeping compound or a wet method. Respiratory protection is not required for this task. Dry sweeping on the project is not permitted and we must utilize the sweeping compounds or wet methods to control the dust. Now let's take a look at chipping concrete with an electric chipping hammer. In the written control plan, the personal protective equipment for this scope of work requires the standard issued Hazelden PPE, but also includes other protective measures. Chipping concrete will require the use of a face shield, hearing protection, and also a long sleeve shirt. The tool being used for this task is an electric chipping hammer, and the dust control method requires the use of the attached dust shroud and also a HEPA dust collection system. This system is designed to collect the respirable dust particles and keep them contained within the dust extractor. This task also has respiratory protection requirements. An N100 respirator with an APF of 10 is required for all indoor work or when outdoor work is conducted for four hours or more. When performing dowel or bolt drilling tasks, the written control plan requires the use of the standard issued Hazelden PPE, but also includes the use of other protective measures. Dowel and bolt drilling will also require the use of a face shield and hearing protection. The tool used for this is the electric hammer. The dust control method that is listed requires the use of an attached dust shroud and also HEPA dust collection system. Once again, this system is designed to collect the respirable dust particles and keep them contained within the dust extractor. Now let's take a look at cutting concrete with a handheld saw. In the control plan for this work, the personal protective equipment requires a standard issued Hazelden PPE and includes some other protective measures as well. Handheld saw cutting of concrete will require the use of a face shield, hearing protection, and also long sleeve shirts. The tool being used for this includes the fuel or electric power demo saw or circular saw equipped with a concrete cutting blade. The dust control method requires the use of an integrated water delivery system. It's important to note that the water delivery system shall be integrated into the tool and must be a continuous feed delivery system. Cutting concrete with a handheld saw also has respiratory protection requirements. 
An N100 respirator with an APF of 10 is required for all indoor work and when outdoor work is conducted for four hours or more. Where vertical grinding is taking place, the written control plan establishes that the personal protective equipment for this scope of work requires the standard issued Hazelden PPE, but also includes some other protective measures. Vertical grinding of concrete will require the use of a face shield, hearing protection, and also long sleeve shirt. The tool being used for this job is a handheld grinder. The dust control methods that are listed require the use of the attached dust shroud and also a HEPA dust collection system. Once again, this system is designed to collect the respirable dust particles and keep them contained within the dust extractor. Vertical concrete grinding does have respiratory protection requirements. When grinding indoors for more than four hours, an N100 respirator with an APF of 10 is required. Respiratory protection for this task is not required when working outdoors. Commercially available HEPA dust extraction systems are required for several types of equipment that were discussed. This requirement enables employers to use equipment that is designed to effectively capture the dust generated by the tool being used and does not introduce new hazards such as obstructing or interfering with safety mechanisms. It's important to note that commercially available limitation is meant to eliminate job built tools made by the employer. Employers can use products that are made by aftermarket manufacturers that are intended to fit the make and model of the tool. These dust collection systems are designed to work effectively with the equipment and not introduce new hazards such as obstructing or interfering with safety mechanism. A dust extraction system looks a lot like a shop vac, but it has a two-stage system that separates the large dust particles from the fine ones, keeping the filter clear so that most of the respirable dust is trapped. Always make sure that the filter is installed before using the dust extractor and use a bag or liner so you are not exposed to respirable silica when emptying the system. If you see dust escaping from the tool or from the extractor, please stop work and check for obstructions or leaks in the system. Integrated water delivery systems are also required for several types of equipment that we discussed. Integrated water systems must be developed specifically for the type of tool in use so they will apply water at the appropriate dust emission points based on the tool configuration and will not interfere with other tool components or safety devices. The water must be applied at flow rates sufficient to minimize release of visible dust. Effective control of the dust depends on factors such as dust particle size, dust velocity, spray nozzle size, and location. Water flow rates for controlling silica dust emissions can vary, therefore it's necessary to follow the manufacturer's instructions when determining the required flow rate for dust suppression systems. When using integrated water delivery systems, it's important to note that the slurry will be generated. Any slurry that has been generated shall be cleaned up to limit secondary exposure to silica dust when the slurry dries. Respirators are required by this standard. The respirators used must comply with the written Hazelden Respiratory Protection Program. When following the specified control methods fully and properly, there are still many work activities in addition to engineering controls that will require the use of respiratory protection. When respirators are required, they will either be an N100 model respirator that has an assigned protection factor of 10 or a PAPR respirator with an assigned protection factor of 25. Sometimes oil may be present in the breathing zone. In this case, a P100 respirator will be required. The location of where the work is being conducted, the amount of time it takes to complete the work, and the potential exposure levels of silica containing dust will all be determining factors in which respiratory protection is required. Fortunately, the designed respiratory protection that is required for each task is clearly spelled out in the written silica control plan and can be found under the respirator section of table one in the chart. It's important to note that workers must be qualified to wear a respirator, special training, medical evaluations, and medical clearance are required before any employee can be permitted to wear a respirator. Please contact your safety department for further questions regarding the respiratory protection program and the requirements involved. The safety of Hazelden employees is an important concern of Hazelden construction. We pledge not to compromise the safety of our employees or subcontractors. Our aim is to prevent all incidents and occupational injuries and illnesses. In return, each employee has the responsibility to recognize, avoid, and report unsafe situations and acts. We expect site superintendents, project managers, supervisors, and employees to ensure safe and helpful working conditions, to instruct employees in safe practices, 
and to inform workers of any workplace hazards. All employees are expected to work in a manner which safeguards themselves and others and to participate in the improvement of work conditions and work practices in order to reduce hazardous conditions at the job site. I would like to personally thank you for your time today and your dedication to working safely. And remember, the safest risk is the one you didn't take. Please work safe.